Well, hi, Linda. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm so happy to have you on the podcast. Thank you, Cheryl. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. For those of you listening, Linda and I used to work together at Miracosta, and I don't know if you knew this, Linda, but one of the first things I ever did when I was hired at Miracosta was write a press release for one of your programs. Oh, because that's what we do. <laughs> and now this was back in like two, 2002, and that was when press releases were the way to get the word out. That's great. I'm glad to know that. <laughs> yeah, and in fact, I loved that press release so much, I ended up taking that class. It was wine tasting. Well, of course it was. <laughs> <laughs> wine tasting is probably our most popular enrichment class we offer, and it's a marvelous class. Oh, I learned so much. I also learned I have a terrible nose for wine. I couldn't, I couldn't smell any of the things the instructor could smell. <laughs> Next time, now you have to come to our brew tasting. Oh, <laughs> and fun. Taste <Okay>. beer. <laughs> Well, since um, one of the reasons I wanted to have you on the podcast is th that more and more colleges are starting to really invest in workforce development and employ employer relations, and you have just done such an amazing job at Maricosta and growing your programs. And from where you were when I worked there back in the early 2000s to where Maricosta is now with community education and workforce development has just been explosive. And I think Maricosta is really a model for colleges around the nation. So yeah. I'm excited to hear about your journey and to learn more about what you do. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. It's It's been a journey for me too. Um, when I came to Miracosta 16 and a half years ago, I thought, you know, the enrichment programs and all that we were doing in the small part of workforce development was, was what I was going to be doing. And um, but as things shifted and changed, and they have shifted and changed a lot over the last you know, 10, 15 years, it's become really clear that um, the community college has a vital role to play in making sure that we serve all of our community, not just those who are bound for traditional education. And I like to say we put the community in community college um, by by doing the kinds of innovative things that my department can do. So what we've found that has changed during that 15 year period is that we've become more conscious as a country that not everyone is destined for college in the traditional sense or college right away and that we need to offer individuals the opportunity for other paths that lead to living wage jobs and great careers. And as we began to, to realize that as a college and as a community, um, based on what industry was telling us, uh, we had to respond. And my department is the place where innovation and flexibility can happen. Um, we're able to do that in my department, community ed and workforce development, because the California Ed Code allows a college to offer a department that is not um, that is not funded by tax dollars and is not in the oversight for that department is not through the chancellor's office, but rather through its own governing board. That means that my department is self-funded both a blessing and a curse. Uh, the blessing is that it makes me very uh, innovative and responsive to what is needed in the community. It allows my department to function outside of faculty purview, outside of chancellor office requirements and laws, and be more um, nimble. The downside of that is it's sometimes hard to run programs that are expensive without charging a lot of money to the um, those who participate. Therefore, I have to rely on grant writing and um, donations and that type of thing to keep the cost as low as possible, especially for work skills training, because you want the diversity in the community to attend, but they can't if it costs too much. So um, we write a lot of grants, we get a lot of grants, and luckily our federal and state and local governments do see the need for workforce development. And so that has been the way we've been able to fund that. 
You know, one of the grants that you were awarded and then I remember, I think it was there when I, when I was still at Maricosta was to create the TCI. And that's this fantastic center. Um, is it technology? What does the TCI stand for? The Technology Career Institute. Technology Career Institute. It, it was landing in Carlsbad. So we wanted a kind of lofty name because Carlsbad likes to have things sound really great. <laughs> <laughs> I might have just had called it the Miracosta Training Center. Or something, but, um, the Technology Career Institute. And it actually is that. It's a technology career and it's an institute of learning um, that's very skills-based, but it's still an institution of learning. So uh, as part of the college. And talk about some of the programs that you've developed that are offered there. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, well, we developed our own center because as a part of the college that isn't uh, credit oriented, isn't um, funded through tax dollars, it was difficult for us to find classroom space and plant great big machinery and great big computers and and um, and robots and things that we were going to need to develop work skills training at the college. There just wasn't space. So we were able to locate a facility um, owned by the city of Carlsbad. We went in partnership with them and got a discounted rate for that. So we're very grateful to the city of Carlsbad. And um, it's 22,000 square feet. We are able to run, um, we have labs and classrooms in areas that are advanced manufacturing, healthcare, uh, emerging technologies, and relevant technologies. And so some of those courses are engineering technician, machining, biomedical equipment technician, where individuals learn how to repair equipment in hospitals and labs. We have a welding uh, course. We have the most um, comprehensive um, grain to glass brew tech program in San Diego. And it is the only Master Brewers Association approved course in California. Um, and so we make our own beer and it's award-winning beer. So um, we also offer um, uh, phlebotomy and real estate. Uh, we offer emergency medical technician, drone technician, and we're about to launch uh, next month our an uh, electrician's program and an HVAC program. So those are exciting for those who want to go into those trades because those are high wage jobs and really vital right now. If you ever try to find an electrician or an HVAC specialist, you know, you either go on a wait, long waiting list or you get someone who you may not know if they're doing just the right job you're hoping for. So. Gosh, it's fantastic. And listening to all these programs, um, it's just amazing how much you can do and how fast you can respond to community employer needs mm -hmm. when you don't have to develop for credit curriculum. So right. for you, like an employer can come to you and say, we really need this type of skill to be trained. Right. And you can have a program up and running relatively quickly. That's true. That's exactly what we do. Um, we're, I, I wanted to mention that not only can we do that, and I'll talk about that in a second, but we are able to run our courses in an accelerated fashion. And I think that's where we um, we really add value to the college. You know, when you when you can run a, a college course, it's inexpensive for students. They they there's a set fee in California to take a credit course. So but it might take two years and life happens in two years, even in just in that period of time. And sometimes it's hard for somebody to fit that into their um, their life. And they have to take finals and they have to take <laughs> midterms and, and maybe that's not that's not for them. We can, on the other hand, run a course quickly in, in a semester or less. And somebody can just concentrate all of their focus on that one core course with just the core foundational skills. And they can do it quickly. We It's rigorous. It's very hands-on. And so all of our courses offer that to the person who really thrives in an environment where hands-on accelerated learning can take place. And so our 
retention rate, you know, those who graduate, very high in the high 90s. Those who find employment afterwards because of our relationship with um, industry and how close we we communicate with them and we bring them in and our students go visit their places of work. Um, we have this great we have this great employment uh, pipeline. And so many, many more students find jobs right after our programs than is typical for a, even a, a credit class um, that we find at the college. So um, so that's that's a, a really huge bonus. Our relationships with industry become vital because they inform the content of our coursework so that we are relevant. Um, and so we keep those relationships going through advisory boards, through these visits, through these um, times when they come and talk to our, our students. So that right. happens all the time. And Do you ever find that any of your programs get like pushback from the credit side? And if so, how do you work with the credit side of the house or faculty who may feel like, oh, this this is an our area of study. How have you built those relationships? Yeah, we have found that to be the case that it sometimes happens like that. Um, I bring the faculty in and our college uh, colleagues in, in at their, our own advisory boards or an internal advisory board so that they help guide us and that our coursework becomes complementary rather than um, competitive with what they're doing. It serves no one well if we're competing with what the college is doing. But if we're in, we're um, a pre-college program or we're a complementary to what they're doing. And I'll give you a good example. We run an engineering technician program and it teaches people the fundamentals of robotics and automation and gets them skilled in mechanical and electrical so that they can go into businesses and help repair automation equipment. Well, we have a an, an engineering technology design portion of the credit side. And what that does is it takes a student through many, um, many classes whereupon they can learn the design behind engineering and use 3D design and printing for that. And even though we have 3D design, it's just a small portion of our engineering course. But if somebody wanted more exposure to design work, and that's the area of engineering technology that they wanted to go into, having them take our course and then go into Miracosta design department is like a one-two punch. It's a great thing to do. It only adds to their wealth and breadth of experience and offers industry a person who has even more to offer. So we like to have it be that kind of a, a, a program where it, it can add more. Or um, conversely, sometimes a college runs a program where it it can be accelerated and it doesn't fit well as a credit program. This is what happened with the real estate program. They were running it in the credit. It took two full years. Somebody who wanted a real estate license could easily do the, the basic course and get a license in much less time. And they realized that. And so now it is in our department. And somebody can get in and out in a much quicker, you know, six months or or less. And um, so that fits. And so that's how we can work together well with the college as in as a complementary department. I love that. I love that. Complementary, not competitive. Right. I feel like that's a great mantra to have to put people at ease because you are. I mean, this, especially in the today's environment with micro credentialing and skills based learning employers might not necessarily want you to have a full degree or they want you to have a full degree and have some additional hands on experience. So in either case, you can really complement the credit program, which is exciting. Yeah, the society is really changing. I'm going to start that again because the lights went out. Um, I was wondering what, what's happening, Linda. <laughs> it automatically turns off if I'm too still. Oh, you don't move. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, 
we, you know, Cheryl, you're right. You're, you're right on target. Um, society is really changing and technology is part of that, or maybe the main reason we are changing so rapidly to keep up with that. We have to be ready to upskill both employed individuals and those who are going into the employment. And so it's really, really important that we, we offer uh, programs where we're, we're both relevant and we're planning for jobs that don't yet exist. So um, MiraCosta's TCI can do that with um, the flexibility needed. We saw a huge change in the way industry has been viewing these um, bachelor's and master's degrees. Oh, maybe not so much master's degrees, but definitely bachelor's degrees as so many individuals approached their new jobs with their happy bachelor's degree and found that their skill level still was lacking. They had some you know, general knowledge, um, but they the industry needed to see a little more skill development. And so complementing the you know, general education with skills training, wherever they can gain it, um, is better than just general education alone. And so um, we have seen a switch in what industry is, especially advanced manufacturing and the trades and, and that sort of a thing where they really want to know what does the individual know how to do, not just know about. And that's become more and more critical because they want them to hit the deck a little bit running and more prepared. They don't have this much time with technology changing so rapidly. So that brings us to the other idea of having the colleges respond very quickly to the needs of, of their local businesses who have employees that now need upskilling because of new technology. And where do they get that? Um, especially if they're a small company, they can't afford to run trainings. They can't afford that. And they don't, they sometimes don't even know how to go about it. They don't have a training department. And so, um, so having the college have a workforce training center where that becomes part of their mission, like TCI, is really helpful for the community. They can lean into their college and say, help. And the college can say, no problem, we've got you covered. I love it. And, and it's such a great way to keep um, your employers engaged with the college and, and positioning the college as someone that can support them and can advance their business yeah. is fantastic. Yeah, I'll be honest. Um, colleges have thought that they have really been, it's going to be very controversial, but colleges have thought they've been really in tune with what their local community businesses and industry needs. So there, there, there they are, you know, oh, I'm the college, we're doing everything possible. And here's the industry and they're saying, not so much. And there's been this, there's disconnect. But if you can, um, if you can respond quicker, if you can listen closer, if you can develop programs and you have the ability to do that through a department like ours, where we hear about it, next thing we know, we put it in a grant so that we have seed money, or we even ask industry for perhaps some donations, which we've received in the past. Um, we can start a program and we can start it in six months or less. That just never happens in the credit side where there's a lot of committee meetings and faculty input and going back to the chancellor's office and back and forth. It just doesn't happen that quickly. And so, but we can. And with technology changing quickly, that does need to happen quickly. So it makes for a, a wonderful option and opportunity for a college to have a department like ours that does that. And speaking of starting programs fast, we're gonna take a quick break to hear from our sponsor. And when we get back, I really wanna to talk to you about how you market these programs because it's one thing to create them, right? But then you have to get people to show up for them, especially because you're self-funded. So I want to hear some of the things that you've done that have been the most successful. So we'll be right back and we'll talk about marketing. How do higher education decision makers find the right solution when technology evolves at light speed? Well, we usually start with our network. 
EdTech Connect is the network that's democratizing the higher ed technology conversation. EdTech Connect is free, so anyone with a .edu email address can sign up and list the software and services they use in their role at their school. Once you're in, you can find out what solutions similar schools are doing all over the country. Whether you're looking to find the hot new AI tool or maybe learn options you have to upgrade your campus search engine or even get to your short list of marketing solution vendors, EdTech Connect is the place to go. So visit edtechconnect.com and set up your free profile to get a pulse for what's happening with higher ed technology today. All right, Linda, welcome back. Thank you. So before uh, we heard from our sponsor, uh, we were talking about how quickly you can get programs up and running, which is amazing because we know on the credit side, there is curriculum review that has to go to the chancellor's office. Um, it can take, you know, two to three years where you can get something up and running really quickly um, in a matter of months. But then you also have to market it. Yeah. And as you've grown so big, I'm sure your overhead has grown large as well. Uh, and so you you have to bring revenue in you're self funded. Uh, how how have you approached marketing? What's been successful for you uh, in growing your programs? Marketing is always that really tough thing and marketing and outreach. It's 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 challenging um, to make sure that you get the word out. You're as a community college, you're really only supposed to market to your district. So and yet if your district bumps up against one that's only five miles away, <laughs> you certainly want those people who are five miles or 10 miles or 15 miles away to be able to join something that maybe that next door neighbor college isn't even offering. Um, so that adds another level of challenge. Um, I'm the kind of person that sees a challenge and likes to just figure out how to get over it. Um, so we try every method possible. Um, but the most important marketing tool we have is by offering such a great program with so much oversight of it to make sure that students' needs are being met, that industry needs are being met, that word of mouth becomes your best selling way of marketing or your best way to market. And so that's what we've discovered that as we start a program, it may it may flounder a bit for the first cohort or two because we do run them in cohorts. Um, but after that, we start to see more and more and more people. That's what happened with the wine tasting. <laughs> <laughs> we, we now end up with like 35 in a class. This is the enrichment part of my department. Right. We now end up with 35 in a class and a wait list. I mean, that's how well received the instructor is and how good he is. And um, we'd like our work skills programs to be like that also. And most of them are. And so we end up with, if we can keep the cost low enough through grants, then we definitely end up with waiting list. But the marketing is done through social media. It's done through a catalog that we send out to our community members three times a year. It's done through constant contact. Um, it's done through PIO, our, our public information office, sending in press releases like you did. Um, so we try, I call that the shotgun approach. Um, when we've brought in marketing firms to do um, specialized marketing, um, sometimes it works okay. Sometimes it's about the same. Um, so I, that must mean that our staff is doing a pretty good job of, of mirroring what they're suggesting anyway. So, um, but we, we try everything we possibly can to make sure that the word gets out, including this podcast. Yeah. Well, first I have to say, I absolutely love that you started with the product itself because so many people that we work with think that marketing is going to come in and it's going to be like this, like a magic, yeah. like like once we have a marketing firm and they do all these tactics, everybody's going to show up. But then it turns out maybe what your marketing's not very good to begin with. So it's not going to sustain. Yeah. yeah. So you have to start with a high quality product mm -hmm. that gets people excited um, and that builds that word of mouth. 
Yeah. And then find out what is drawing people to the program and what makes the program so special. And then that becomes what you market. So I love that you started with that and not just with a bunch of tactics. Yeah, no, that doesn't work and it never has. <laughs> and so you have to be prepared to have a lull at the beginning when people don't know. We just ran into that with our new electrician and HVAC programs. Um, we ran an orientation. The response was kind of small. And so, you know, we're going to run our first pilot classes with small course classes, hoping that we not only get the word out, but that they get the word out. And so um, the other part of marketing, it really has to do with how much our instructors are in out in the community and letting people know about it. If they have a good relationship with alumni, if they have a good relationship with industry, um, it makes a world of difference. If they are posting things on their Facebook because they're excited about what their class did, if they are posting things on LinkedIn because they're excited, and their students in the class are also posting, that's the best way for us to get the word out also. So um, we we know that that's a, a, a really strategic marketing tool. Without the instructor engagement, we do not do well. Yeah, that's great. And do you, do you encourage, that, like, do you ask them to do that or do you just find, yeah, you do, so you're really specific. Yeah, we're very, very strategic and intentional in asking our instructors to do that. Um, and then when they come to me and ask for a pay increase, yeah. <laughs> I do what I can to do that because they're working extra and they're working hard. And, and we find that we end up by, we end up with excellent instructors because that becomes part of what they do. And the students see the engagement and they become interested in. Yeah. It just, yeah. It's, it's a great circle. Everybody needs to be marketing. This is one of my messages that I tell, I like beat my drum all the time. It's it's not one person's job to market. Every single person is a marketer. Everybody. Exactly right. I yeah. couldn't agree more. And especially the faculty there, that's a fantastic way to reach people, um, to show the passion behind the program, what students are learning. Um, I, can, I can see why you get such great response from that. Sure. I've also been working a lot with colleges who are redoing their community education and non credit class schedules. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because there was this trend a few years ago where uh, a lot of the colleges we worked with stopped doing the mailing of those schedules yeah. and they saw their enrollments like plummet as a result. Yeah. And so now they're coming back and they're wanting to reimagine those pieces. So that's been an important part for you too, right? That three time a year mailing. Yes, it's really costly. I have to say it's very costly, but it would be more costly for our department without it. That's how I justify it. And the reason for that is, and you know, I'm sure Cheryl, you could speak to this way more than I could, but what we what we sense is that we have a, an entire population of people who still like to grab, grab something, look through it and think about it and put it on their counter and, and show it to their niece or nephew or uh, uncle or aunt or whomever. And, and so we, we need to keep attracting that interest. Otherwise, I, not everybody can find us. Yeah. And, and community education and non-credit have something for almost everyone. So those catalogs and schedules, no matter who gets it out of the mail, there might be something in there for them. Where a credit class schedule is really just such a small population that mass mailing it never really did much for colleges. Um, so I think there was some bleed over where non-credit and community ed programs were like, oh, the credit's gotten rid of it, maybe we should too. And they found that it's, it's probably their top marketing uh, yeah. tactic that they do. Yes, so. it is. It definitely is. And you can tell because the minute it hits everybody's mailboxes, yeah. our enrollments just explode. So yeah. if that weren't the case, we wouldn't see that explosion. We just see incremental enrollments all along. So, And you have a great publication. So I'll put in the show notes um, a link to your publication because I get asked all the time, can we see, do you have any examples of colleges who are doing this well? Yeah. Uh, and that brings me to talking to you about 
how you fund marketing because you've even been creative in finding ways to get support from the college and bringing in your own graphic designer and having help yourself mm -hmm. uh, because you're self-funded and and how have you accomplished some of those things um well we realized early on that making yourself look professional making yourself look as interesting and exciting as possible as we are, <laughs> um, is really important. And it, it's going to take some really good graphic design. It's going to take some good thought. And so um, we hired a graphic designer as, and we we are on such thin margins in community ed and workforce development. When we're nonprofit, we're self-funded, we try to you know keep our prices as low as we can possibly get, and then even lower by writing grants to offset those. So you know we're just we're just walking on that edge. So it's not like you know having a graphic designer would have been my very first choice, except it kind of was, because if you don't put out good marketing materials that look beautiful and that attract people and help people realize that this is a very professional level operation, whether it's enrichment or whether it's work skills training, that their investment in their hard-earned money may not be where they it may not be what they want to do with it if they're if they're doubtful. So having a great graphic designer as we do was was a big key to that. And so we've been enjoying having that person. How do we fund it? It just becomes part of our operation and making sure that we do write those grants and that some of that cost is put into the grants because without it, we wouldn't have, you know, we wouldn't have as many students. So we can do that. That helps. Um, sometimes we um, we get money from the college, not because we're allowed to have money, but because they pay for advertisements within our catalog. So if we have a cover or a, not a cover, but a inside the cover and we tell them about the credit programs or the community learning center, then then that becomes part of their marketing. And so they can they can at that point justify helping contribute to the cost of it. So those are ways in which somebody can help fund it. What we cannot do and you do not want to do as a community, in case you're listening and you're community ed, what you do not want to do is advertise local businesses as much as that would definitely pay for it. And they would probably love to do that. It puts your catalog into a for-profit um, and um, it takes you, it takes you out of the status that you're in and that becomes problematic. Oh, that's really interesting because you can use your nonprofit status for a huge reduction on mailing. That's correct. Yeah. And so if you're putting ads for for profit companies, then you, wow, you, I never knew that. Yeah. So, so thank you don't you. want to do that. That's a great tip. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's a great takeaway. I actually just told uh, a division like yours, uh, I used you as an example. I said, why don't you go talk to your um, non-credit department and advertise, do an ESL advertisement inside your small, because they have a very small program, they could give you funds, what they would spend on marketing elsewhere, and then you can print and mail these to people. Yeah, and, and some colleges, I don't know who they might be out there, um, may have a foundation who would like to help sponsor some of the catalog. They're allowed to do for their unrestricted funds, they're allowed to assist in any way they can. And if they choose that your programs and are really necessary and needed, and they, that's one of their efforts, they can help offset the cost. So for our marketing directors, a lot of our listeners to this podcast are marketing uh, personnel or directors at community colleges. My takeaway for you from Linda is don't just say no to your community uh, education department because there are creative ways that you can support them um, without crossing, you know, any boundaries or breaking any right. rules. So, right, right. Yeah. Just got to think outside the box a little bit. There's always a workaround. <laughs> There's always a workaround. And that's Linda has always, I told her, you're the one person at the college where uh, she just never takes no for an answer. She always finds a workaround. Well, what do they say? Well-behaved women never make history. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I I don't think that there's anybody at the college that um, that has a, a really negative opinion of us. 
it's kind of one of those uh, keep your friends close, keep your enemies closer. <laughs> so whenever I have had somebody who has who has felt challenged by the things that we do, who has felt challenged by the um, by the pace at which we require things to move, um, I immediately include them in our internal advisory board, or I immediately chat with them about ways in which we can work well together and not be competitive and not be a, a pain in the neck and things of that sort. And and so it's it seems to have worked. I like to be I I, I call it being unific. So trying to do things in a way where we don't let the automatic no or the automatic it's never been done this way before deter us but on the other hand we don't make everybody mad at us you know so there's there's that balance of being unific to make that happen sometimes it means being patient and sometimes it means bringing in enough people to have a conversation to either come up with a different way to do it that still achieves the same goal or um or changing their mind so, well, you've definitely done a great job, um, and I've always admired the work that you've done. And before we wrap up our conversation, just wanted to see if you had any advice for colleges out there that might have a smaller workforce development community education department or are hoping to grow. Like, what are some tips you might offer them so they can be successful in the next couple of years? Well, I think. Um... The most important thing to understand is that a community college has so much more to offer than sometimes we limit ourselves to thinking. So that's the first thing. Um, community colleges, it is really time for us to grow up and become enterprising, entrepreneur, entrepreneurial, um, innovative in ways that we haven't thought of before with the needs of our community, with our needs of our industries. We must find a way to do that. And we, we know that that need is there because there are statistics about it in the years 2035 um, and, and beyond. We don't even know what jobs those are going to be. So we can't rely on what we've always done and think that that's going to be enough. So, so the choice isn't almost a choice. We must progress if we are futures thinking, if we are going to adapt, or else we will become irrelevant. And we don't want that to happen. So to stay relevant, we need to invest in thinking first, thinking first about how to go about creating these uh, organizations within our organization, like community ed and workforce development, that could do more, that could meet those needs and add to the um, the value of the college. Second, we need to be able to find individuals that are dynamic and have visionary ideas and innovation um, that can bring that to to bear in those departments. Um, I had to become that for the college. I didn't know I would be that. I, I, when I first came to Miracosta, I thought, wow, when I heard about a college that was doing like really innovative things around the United States, I thought, that sounds exhausting. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, once you take one step, the next one follows and then the next one follows that. And suddenly you're, you're in it. To your net, no, you're in it and you enjoy it and you become passionate about it. So find those people who have that um, motivation to help individuals because we save lives here. I know that college saves lives. We also save lives, but we save different people who are often marginalized, who are often think that the college is not a place for them. So this is really exciting. And then Find ways to um, to seek out that funding from your senators, from your congressmen, from the Department of dot 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 labor, commerce, education, whomever. Find those ways to bring in funds that get these things started. Just start with one thing, and then move out from there. But think entrepreneurial enterprise. Think that and bring that to your college. I read a statistic lately 
that said 70% of those coming out of high school think that they want to be entrepreneurs. That is a great statistic because it means there's going to be all kinds of innovation. Now, we know, practically speaking, that not all of the 70% are going to be entrepreneurial. We just know that that's probably an unrealistic expectation. But if our community colleges are not responding to their desire to be entrepreneurial, to think of enterprises as an option for them, and we're stuck in tradition, we are going to be irre irrelevant. We are going to outdate ourselves to what is needed. And our new generation are going to seek their knowledge and skills from other technology and methods available to them. So we're in a competition there. How are we going to stay relevant? So that is my comment to those out there who are thinking about it. Um, think about futures and what are what it, what is needed, and find those people that can create these types of programs. Okay. Well, great advice. You got me all fired up now too. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna go find some more people to help these visions come to life. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And for TCI, we need a bigger building. We've got twenty two thousand square feet, and every inch of it, and every day of the week is occupied in this building. <sighs> So, so finding great. funders to help us actually build a facility that becomes the center of a community for innovation and enterprise and, and business entrepreneurship, you know, that, that becomes really critical. And so that's my next development step. So if anybody out there who lives in our area in, in San Diego, North San Diego, would like their name on a building uh, or would like to see that happen, please do contact me because that is what's needed. And every urban area needs a center like that where that is happening. Accelerated work skills in, in you know, entrepreneurship, blending the two all happens in one location. That is the future of our community colleges. Well, congratulations on that growth. I remember, I remember the grand opening of the TCI and you, I think you started with, was it Machinist? Yes, we did. Yeah. And there were some empty classrooms, but you had these like big machines and we brought in the Chamber of Commerce and we brought in the assembly member and now you've outgrown this space. Right. So I hope you have another giant grand opening. Thank you. <laughs> I, like, oh, I do too. Over there. I'll bring my pom poms and be like, yay, Linda. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that very, very much. Yeah. Thank well, you, it's been Sarah. a delight talking to you. It's been so great having you on the podcast. I think you've given some wonderful advice uh, to other colleges out there. And I'm sure Linda is always available if anybody wants to connect with you. Um, I'll put your website in the show notes. Thank you. Yeah. Well, Sharon, it's always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. And um, so thank you very much for having me on today. Thanks, Linda.